We're continuing with our topic of how Islam is good. What is it that makes Islam good is that it is not just a religion, but it is a wonderful way of life perfected for us by Allah himself. And we have the guidance. We have the examples. We have the role models in front of us and those guide that 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 guidance, that example, and that role model is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the understanding that his companions had. With the understanding that the Prophet's companions had. That's very important, you know, to say that I am practicing Islam the way the Prophet did in accordance to the understanding of his companions because his companions were the best of this nation. Muslims today have their own understanding. For example, they think that in order to be a scholar, you have to go to some university and get a degree in Islam. That is not a scholar. If that's the case, what degrees did any of those companions have? What degrees did any of those imams, that those four imams have? What degrees did Ibn Taymiyyah and Cain have? What degrees did Sheikh Elbani and Sheikh Uthameen have? These men didn't have no degrees. Nothing in Islam says that to become a scholar, you get a degree. The scholar is a term of endearment. It's a term of endearment that you earn from your peers. Your peers give you that title based on how you live and practice your religion. And you got to earn it. It takes years, a scholar, to earn it. How are you going to be a scholar when you're only 20 years old? You don't know enough. You ain't lived long enough to earn that title. You haven't experienced enough in life to earn that title. Okay? So again, it's important for us to say, I am living Islam. Based on the example that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with, and I am implementing the understanding of the companions in that, okay? Because they understand this religion better than any man or woman today. Somebody ask you, is there anyone here that I can learn the deen from? Any scholars here I can learn from? You don't sit up and tell them, yeah, uh, this person went to school and got a Ph.D. Because we got some people. By the way, guys, for those of you who don't know, the president of the Gay Muslims Association has a Ph.D. in Islam. Can you all believe that? That shows what those degrees can do. Just because a person got a degree in Islam don't make them no scholar. You got a woman that travels around the earth giving lectures and leading men in prayer. She has a Ph.D. in the, in the Quran. She has a Ph.D. in the Arabic language. And she's, in a, and, and, and she's got a degree in Akita. And she still don't know that a woman cannot lead a man in prayers. Astaghfirullah. That's how lost we are today. Paper doesn't mean nothing. Scholar is a term of endearment that you earn from your peers based on your knowledge and implementation of this, this religion. Okay? And today what we're going to speak about is how if we adhere to the prophet's guidance, if we adhere to trying to maintain the understanding of the deen that those companions have, then it won't be so hard for you to live amongst the hypocrites and live amongst the unbelievers. Remember, guys, the earth belongs to a law. You can live anywhere on this earth as long as you are able to practice your religion. 
So I can live amongst a bunch of Kaffirs. And I can still maintain level four jihad. Okay? As long as I follow and stick to the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad and that understanding that his companions have. I can also move to a Muslim land and I can live amongst a bunch of hypocrites too and still maintain level four. As long as I follow the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the understanding of his companions. Y'all understand what I'm teaching here now? So again, if you stick to the Prophet's guidance and that understanding that those companions had, then you can live anywhere. You can live amongst the hypocrites and amongst the unbelievers. And guess what? Our prophet taught us how. Let's look at the PowerPoint here. Remember the last time we met, we talked about how the Arabs from Medina, they were the ones who took the prophet Muhammad in, offered him their pledge of allegiance and their protection. And that's when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam announced to the Muslims it was no longer lawful to live in Mecca. It was no longer lawful to live in the Kafir land because they were not allowed to practice their religion openly. So thus he commanded that the Muslims migrate to Medina. And that's what many of them did. There were still some, a person sent me an email asking me, were there still some Muslims that remained in Mecca? Yes, there were. Some people couldn't migrate because they, had, they just had other obligations there or whatnot. But most of them did. And after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated to Medina, what, is, what's, what was one of the first things he did? He went into a peace agreement with the unbelievers who lived there. Okay, because the Arabs of Medina lived with the Jews. Remember, that's how they were so receptive to the prophet's call because the Jews had been talking about the, a prophet was coming. So when the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arrived in Medina, at first the Jews were glad to meet him. They were glad to meet him because they had been trying to get the Arabs to stop worshiping idols. So they wanted to meet this man. They wanted to meet this man who was able to turn these pagans away from rocks and, and get them to believe in the one God. And we learn from the prophet's example the importance of keeping our agreements and also the importance of maintaining peace if possible with others. Listen to what the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said upon arriving in Medina. He said the protection granted by the Muslims is one and it must be respected by the humblest of them. And whoever violates the trust of, uh, with the Muslim, there is upon him the curse of Allah, the angels and all mankind. And neither an obligatory deed or a voluntary deed would be accepted from him as payment on the day of judgment. So here we can see the prophet is stressing the importance, the importance of us honoring our agreements. If you go into a peace treaty or a peace agreement with another people, you have to stick to it. You cannot violate it. If you do, you have the curse of a law on you. And what does that mean? That means a law does not accept your good deeds at all. Also in another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when a person has an agreement with people, he must not loosen or strengthen it until its term is complete. Or both parties agree to end it. So again, even, even if you go into a contract with a Kafir, because that's what the Prophet did. He went into a contract with the Jews to have peace. The fact that they're Kafir does not mean that you can break that contract. You have to keep that contract. Okay? Very important thing to note. So thus we can see that upholding our agreements is very important. And to not uphold our agreements will result in your own destruction. 
Listen to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. Whenever a people violate an agreement, the enemy will triumph over them. So maybe that's why we Muslims, you know, are not successful today. Many Muslims today wonder why it is that our enemies seem to always overpower us. Well, this could be one of the reasons. We keep breaking our contracts. We keep breaking our agreements with others. So we need to work on fulfilling our agreements and keeping our trust. And then perhaps our enemies would loosen their grip over us. Okay. And again, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us his guidance. His example on how to deal with non-Muslims and how to deal with the hypocrites amongst us. For example, whenever the prophet entered into an agreement of peace with the unbelievers, he, he was never the first to break it. He was never the first to break it. Only if they broke their agreement would he fight against them. For example, when he migrated to Medina, he wanted part of his agreement with the Jews was, if your enemy attacks you, we will help you. And if an enemy attacks us, you will help us. What happened was the Jews didn't implement their end. When the Quraysh came to fight against the Muslims at Badr and Uhud in the ditch, the Jews betrayed the prophet. Instead of them coming to help the Muslims, they broke their agreement. Okay, and that's what caused the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to run one of the tribes out of Medina when they broke their agreement to assist. But he never broke his with them. As long as they upheld their contract, their end of the contract, he upheld the ours. Okay, but what about the hypocrites? What about the hypocrites? I want you guys to understand who the hypocrites are. They're, they're Kafir too. But the difference between them is they're Muslims. They're people who say they believe La Yalah, Allah, Muhammad, Dor, Rasulullah. They claim to be like you and me. But in reality, they don't really believe. And they're worse. How did the Prophet treat them? Well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was commanded by Allah to accept their declarations and to make personal struggle against them with arguments and evidence. Also, he was commanded to avoid the hypocrites and to speak harshly to them and to speak to them with words that will shake their heart. Everybody understand that? We don't deal with the hypocrites like we do the non-Muslims. The hypocrites, you have to be harsh with them. You have to stick to the Quran and the Sunnah. Because they're going to come to you and try to tell you, for example, Astaghfirullah, Sister Layla's teaching you wrong. There's nothing wrong, you know, with the woman arching her eyebrows. Or there's nothing wrong with this. You have to deal with them with evidence. And you have to be harsh with them. You can't play with the hypocrites. You can't joke with them. And we have to avoid them as much as we can. Even though they live amongst us. Even though we live amongst hypocrites, we have to try to avoid them. Their treatment demands a more severe treatment than the unbelievers because they know the truth, but they choose to reject it. And they choose to stand in the way of it. People say, why is Layla so harsh? I'm only harsh with the hypocrites because the law commands me to be that way. I don't have any Kafirs, uh, no non-Muslims joining my, my website causing problems. The problems I've had have always come from people claiming to be Muslim, but they come in here trying to argue and trying to pull you away from the truth. So I have to be harsh with them. And I stick to the Quran and the Hadiths when I deal with them. And if they get too bad, I kick them out and ban them. Because that's what Allah says we have to do. And that's how our prophet was too. And to show how dangerous the hypocrites are. 
to show that they are worse than the non-Muslims, Allah forbade the prophet from offering of the funeral prayer over them. That shows how the hypocrites are worse than the non-Muslims. Also, he was the prophet was forbidden from standing at their grave sites to make dua for them. And he was told by Allah that it was the same whether he sought forgiveness for them or not. Allah will never forgive them. So that's why Allah forbade the prophet from making dua for the hypocrites. Remember a lot of people think, oh, we're supposed to make dua for the hypocrite. Well, guess what? Allah forbade it. We have to understand, guys, those hypocrites, they are damned to hell forever. And they will be in the lowest levels of the hell fire. They will be lower than the non-Muslims who did not embrace this way of life. Okay? So how do you think the prophet would react to people today? Those people today on Facebook. Those Muslims in your community who stand in the way of the truth. Those Muslims on Facebook who slander you. How do you think the prophet would deal with them today? How would he react if he were here to see the evil that they do on Facebook, pale talk, and the likes? SubhanAllah. You think Layla Nasheba's harsh. I'm not harsh at all compared to the prophet and his companions. Okay? So again, you know, the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his example, he taught us that when we live amongst non-Muslims, we should try to go into agreements of peace with them. So again, I can live anywhere on this earth. That's why you hear Muslims say we live in America and we respect the laws here. You come to America to live. We respect the laws. We don't go around killing people, robbing, stealing. We also don't go around implementing Sharia law either because this is a non-Muslim land. I am not going to cut off a Muslim's hand who stole. I'm not going to cut off somebody's hand for stealing because this is not the land for that. Our laws are for us. Oh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us in another authentic hadith, our laws are for us. They are not for the non-Muslims. Okay, you want to live Sharia, move to Saudi Arabia, because that's the only Muslim land that claims to live by Sharia. And even they don't live total Sharia. Okay, so the prophet taught us when we live amongst the non-Muslims to go into agreements of peace with them. And he also taught us to beware of the hypocrites amongst us, to deal with them harshly and with evidence and try to avoid them as much as possible. But what about those who are like us? What about the Muslims who are like us? Well, again, we turn to the prophet and his companions. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was commanded to be patient with the true believer. He was commanded to overlook their faults. Okay. He was commanded to forgive the true believers, to not hold grudges against them, and to make dua for them. So for those Muslims living amongst us who are trying to live like you and me, who are trying to adhere to the Sunnah, we try to love them for the sake of Allah. We overlook their mistakes. We make dua for them. Is this clear? Because there are some Muslims that think we go around making dua for, calf, for kafirs and hypocrites. No, we don't. We only make dua for the believers amongst us. Also, the Allah commanded the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to cut off any relations to those who disobey him. For those people who disobey him to cut off the ties with them and to stay away from them until they come back. They were good on boycotting. If the prophet had a companion amongst him who refused to listen, they would cut him off and boycott him until he repented. For example, there was one man who was caught drinking. Then he got caught again and again and again. Then the prophets just cut him off. He said, until you stop drinking alcohol, we're going to boycott you. We're not going to talk to you or have anything else to do with you until you stop. Okay. And also the prophet implemented our punishments when we do wrong. 
When this man was caught drinking, he was beaten. Okay? When he got caught again, he was beaten again. If you got caught stealing, you'd, he'd cut off your right hand. Because remember, Medina became an Islamic state. And so the, these same commands should apply to the leaders of the Muslims today too. These imams who sit on Facebook thinking that they're scholars when you ain't. Just because you're traveling around smiling on YouTube, you are invited to these conferences. Most of these conferences are ran by Sufis anyway. Okay, but you go to these conferences, you know, that, ain't, that don't make you no, sco no scholar. You should be treating people the same way the prophet did. You should be forgiving to your brother and sister in Islam who is trying to live the sunnah. And you should be harsh with the hypocrites, those Muslims who refuse to wear hijab, those Muslims who refuse to do what Allah commands, you should be harsh with them. Okay, but unfortunately, you know, we don't follow the prophet's example, even though we claim to be of him today. Many of us don't. That's sad. Okay. Also, guys, Allah taught the prophet, commanded the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to repel his enemies amongst the, the devils of mankind by that which is better. And to answer a bad deed with a good deed. And to respond to ignorance with kindness. In other words, remember I tell you guys, you know, if a person comes up to you wanting to debate the religion, turn away from them. Remember what happened to me a, a few weeks ago at the store with this non-Muslim uh, man, you know, wanted to come at me. I just turned away. I walked away from him. Turn away. That's what Allah commands us to do. I learned that from the prophet. The prophet would turn away from the ignorant. Remember when he was walking with his wife, the Jews tried to be funny, told him, Assalamu alaikum, wish death upon him. And he said, Walaikum, the same to you. He repelled bad with good. That's an example of repelling evil with good. You tried to wish death on me, well, Walaikum, the same to you. I turned it back on you. And if you do that, guys, if you refuse to allow your enemies to pull you down to that their level, what will that do? It will become as though your enemy will, will end up respecting you. Your enemy will end up respecting you. They may not like you, but you'll end up earning their respect. And again, the believers today need to incorporate this into their dealings with the people of falsehood. Rather than allowing the non-Muslims to cause you to stoop to their level and perhaps make you even lower than they, or the hypocrites too. The hypocrites are very argumentative. Rather than allowing those hypocrites to cause you to stoop to their level, implement the way the prophet did of turning away from those who are ignorant. I'm not going to engage you. I'm not going to argue the religion with you. If you've lost your religion, go out and look for it. I'm not going to argue it with you. Or you want to, you think you being funny? Walaikum, the same to you. Implement that into your life like the prophet did. And that'll make your enemies, hypocrites, and the non-Muslims respect you. They may not like you, but they'll respect you. And also, Allah taught the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how to handle the devils amongst the jinn as well. And how do we handle the, the jinn? By simply saying, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan nirajin. Seeking refuge in them. Okay? Seek refuge from the jinn. Okay? So thus, guys, what do we learn from this example of the prophet and what he did when he first arrived in Medina? Again, the first thing he did was he went into agreements of peace with the non-Muslims that lived there. And also Allah taught him how to handle the hypocrites because many of the Jews became Muslim, not out of sincerity to Islam, but because they wanted to infiltrate the prophet to try to bring him down. But Allah taught him how to handle both. So we learned the importance of trying to live in peace with others. 
And we again, we have to remember, guys, the people of truth, we will always be in a minority. There will be fewer people of the truth than there are people who are not of the truth. So it's important for us to, to try to live in peace amongst others. Again, any contracts you make with non-Muslims or hypocrites, you have to fulfill them. Fulfilling them shows your honor. Fulfilling them strengthens your relationship with Allah. You guys live here in America. This is a non-Muslim land. You have to abide by the laws here. No murder, no stealing, no raping, no plundering, no killing. In regards to the hypocrites, try your very, very best to never have to do a contract with them because you can never trust the hypocrites. They'll always break their contract. They'll always break their trust. And finally, we learn from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his example to not allow the ignorance and misguidance of others to cause us to become lower than they are. As Muslims, you have to live each day of your life enjoining what is good in a good way and forbidding what is evil in a good way. And finally, to remember to always keep our trust in Allah and to seek refuge with Allah from the evil that surrounds us. On that note, we'll stop right here. Sooner,